So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nora Sutton. I'm a researcher at Wageningen University. Probably that name's familiar to a lot of people because of uh, our university does a lot of agricultural research. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about our water research, which is also really important. Uh, I work in the Department of uh, Environmental Technology, and I do research on bioremediation of emerging contaminants, especially in groundwater systems. Um, and today I hope to start by convincing at least a portion of you that these contaminants are really important for our groundwater quality. Um, I was quite surprised yesterday uh, at some of the sessions discussing, for example, reuse of wastewater effluent and infiltration and recharge of groundwater, and there wasn't much consideration for emerging contaminants. In Europe, we are quite concerned about a lot of these compounds in our water cycle. Um, this is a study from a couple years ago. Um, in Europe where they analyzed approximately 160 different groundwater samples and they looked for a variety of different emerging contaminants, so pesticides, personal care products and pharmaceuticals, as well as transition products of some of those compounds. And they saw a lot of these compounds present at concentrations higher than 0.1 microgram per liter. And the 0.1 microgram per liter is important because that's the threshold, uh, so the European guideline for drinking water. So when contaminants are present at a higher concentration than 0.1 microgram per liter, it forms a threat for future drinking water. Um, there was a similar study also a couple of years ago uh, in the U.S. Here they looked at, I think, approximately 40 and 45 samples uh, across the U.S., uh, groundwater samples. And here they were specifically looking for compounds that would indicate um, human uh, wastewater uh, influence on groundwater. And there you also see a variety of different personal care products and pharmaceuticals, uh, as well as transition products. And some of them are actually present at quite high concentrations, so in the tens of uh, micrograms per liter. Now, one of the reasons why we're so concerned about this in the Netherlands uh, is because we produce about two-thirds of our drinking water from groundwater. Um, you can see here, no, this one, yeah. You can see here a map of the Netherlands. Uh, for your reference, Amsterdam's right about here. Um, and all of the yellow spots are locations where we use groundwater for drinking water production. So those are all extraction locations. Um, we have in the Netherlands this clean source policy, um, and there's a whole infrastructure of groundwater protection areas, which are uh, indicated with these sorts of signs. You'll see them if you cycle around the countryside in the Netherlands. Uh, and these are places where the above ground activities are limited in order to protect the groundwater. So we really have a strong interest and also a, a lot invested in keeping our groundwater clean. Um, and that then uh, this is what a typical drinking water extraction location looks like, so it's a schematic of one. Um, you'll have a, a selection or a, a, an array of drinking water production wells. They're um, filtered over pretty long distances, so maybe 20 meters or so. Uh, and they control the high pumping rates, control the, the local hydrology, so it really draws in all of the local water. Um, drinking water companies have a strong interest in being able to predict the future quality of their water, and therefore they sink a lot of um, monitoring wells at different distances around the central array of uh, production wells. And in these monitoring wells, then they monitor hundreds of different organic uh, emerging contaminants. In Europe, we call them micropollutants, uh, but it's the same thing. So uh, hundreds of different uh, emerging uh, contaminants. And what they see are low concentrations of these uh, contaminants. And what they would like to be able to do is to be able to predict if they see a contaminant, for example, in this monitoring well, uh, be able to predict and steer uh, removal of that contaminant, so know whether or not it forms a threat for future drinking water quality. And that's what I do in my research. Um, uh, I try to understand the fate and transformation of these contaminants between the monitoring well uh, and the drinking water production well. And I especially look at uh, the potential for biodegradation. Uh, so biodegradation uses the natural microbial community to remove these contaminants. Bacteria can consume them uh, as a substrate or degrade them in other pathways. Um, and so I try to use the natural microbial community uh, to remove these compounds. Now, there's a number of different things that uh, Im impact whether or not that occurs. One is the microbial community itself, of course. Um, also, the redox conditions are very important. Um, so in California and in many other places, there's aerobic groundwater, so there's oxygen present in the groundwater. In the Netherlands, we have mostly anaerobic conditions, so the bacteria have to use, for example, nitrate or iron or something else for, uh, for metabolism. 
Uh, another thing that in impacts uh, biodegradation is dissolved organic carbon. So that's other naturally present organic substrates uh, that affect the microbial community. And those are substrates that can support biodegradation because they support the bacteria growing. So you have a larger biomass, so more degradation capacity. But it's also another substrate. So if, uh, if a particular bacteria was confronted with either some organic substrate or a micropollutant, it could be that they preferentially degrade the organic substrate and therefore biodegradation doesn't occur. So the goal of our research is really to understand how all of these factors form together into natural attenuation. Um, so what is the role of each of these and how can we steer that process? Um, so we really want to develop techniques to better understand and implement biodegradation. And I do this in two, uh, well, two major focuses. One is in the lab, then we use very controlled conditions to understand the degradation of a couple of compounds, and I'll just briefly touch on that. Uh, and the other thing that we do is um, use DNA tools, so molecular biological tools in the field to understand what's happening uh, in C2. So just briefly um, on the degradation experiments, um, these are focused on a couple of different priority compounds. These are compounds selected um, because they're of particular concern for drinking water companies, uh, so a selection of pesticides. Uh, and there we examine their degradation under controlled conditions in the lab. And I mostly just wanted to show these structures for you so that if anyone in the room says, oh, well, this is one that I really work on, then we can discuss about it later. Um, and for these compounds, then, we do uh, these degradation experiments, so either in batches or in column experiments to simulate uh, groundwater flow. So that was the degradation experiments. The other side of the research is, um, as I said, using these DNA-based tools to understand biodegradation. So in groundwater, you have well, a variety of different components, but the most important ones for this research are the microbial community, so who's there in terms of the bacteria, um, the groundwater geochemistry, so dissolved organic carbon, nutrient abundance, stuff like that and then the presence of these contaminants, so these emerging contaminants. And all of these interact with each other, so if you have a particularly active microbial community, maybe they can deplete the nutrient abundance because they use the nutrients for their own growth. Um, if you have particularly high concentrations of contaminants, that can then select for a certain microbial community. So this whole interaction, this interplay between the three um, is quite dynamic, and it also determines when bioremediation occurs. So when you have the right uh, the right balance of these three things, uh, then biodegradation of these emerging contaminants can, can occur. And so we wanted to study how this is happening actually in the field, um, and we did that at a real drinking water production location. So this is a location in the Netherlands. Um, you can see here an array of production wells um, with fil quite uh, deep filters, uh, high pumping rates. And uh, then you can see around it all of the grayish white dots uh, our monitoring wells, and those are all filtered at discrete depths. Um, and so you have this, these production wells in the middle that draw in the local water. At this location, there's also a canal, which I've highlighted here. Um, this is a canal that receives wastewater treatment plant effluent. Um, and because it's right next to the production wells, you actually get infiltration, direct infiltration of this surface water into the groundwater at quite high rates. Um, and you'll see that back in the monitoring data in a moment. Um, so for this study, we focused on two wells, wells 22 and 23, so one really right directly next to the canal, uh, and well 23 a little farther downstream. Um, and I'll show first a little snapshot of the groundwater composition. Um, so you have above well 22, the one right next to the canal, uh, and below well 23, the one a little farther uh, downstream. Uh, you can see in well 23, for example, a very nice uh, profile of redox conditions. So you have uh, nitrate in the upper layers and then dissolved iron uh, in the lower layers. So that indicates a shift from suboxic conditions to more anaerobic conditions. Uh, if you look at the contaminant concentrations, you can see in well 22 in the upper layers uh, the influence of that surface water, so the canal water. Uh, you can see, for example, carbamazepine, which is a pharmaceutical, and you can see that in the upper layers, so indicating that the wastewater effluent that is in that canal is also being drawn into the groundwater. Um, so this, um, I just wanted to briefly show you the long-term monitoring data at this location. So this is well 22, well 23 at all of the different depths. Uh, and you don't need to be able to read it all. All you need to be able to see is that uh, for 
different compounds, you see quite large differences in the concentration per year. So this is monitoring data from 2000 to 2015, and you can see, for example, here the concentration of bentazone increases and then decreases and then increases and then decreases. And all I want to show here is that purely based on chemical data, so just analyzing the concentrations of these contaminants, we can't really assess whether or not biodegradation, biodegradation is occurring. Um, so these contaminants are present often in a, a cloud or a, a, a section of groundwater of a particular quality, uh, and that will wash through, and you'll monitor that pesticide, for example, will be there for a couple of years, and then with groundwater flow, it's washed away. So just purely based on chemical data, we can actually say whether or not degradation is occurring. And so that's why in this research, we look at um, molecular biological tools, so DNA-based tools. Um, I wasn't sure about everyone's background, so I, just really briefly on these tools, um, I'll try to say it in layman's terms. Um, so bacteria have their own fingerprint, and their fingerprint is the 16S rRNA gene. So that's a gene uh, that you can sequence. Uh, and with that sequence, you can see who's there. Just like if I was to walk around here and take everyone's fingerprint, I could also theoretically say who's here. Uh, and so by collecting the DNA and then sequencing the certain gene, you can say what is the composition of your microbial community. And that's what we did for this location. Uh, so we collected groundwater samples. You can see them all in my little Honda Civic. Uh, and we, there's very little biomass in these, uh, in these groundwater samples, so you have to filter a lot of water in order to get enough DNA to do these sorts of analysis. So we collect the groundwater samples, then we filter it. You do DNA extraction on the filter, so on that concentrated biomass, um, some PCRs. You send it away for sequencing. Uh, you get back a whole pile of data, and then uh, use a variety of different bioinformatics tools to analyze the data, so to filter it and... Uh, and understand the microbial community. And for this study, uh, we did it at two locations, uh, two wells, I should say, two wells, wells 22 and 23. So you can see here, this is well 22, this is well 23. Um, we did five filter depths per well. So one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, and then we did it at two time points in duplicate. So uh, time point, uh, in November 2014 was A and B, and in February 2016 was C and D. And you can see here already the massive amounts of data you get back. So this is the number of sequences per sample, and some of them are over 100,000 sequences per sample, so quite a bit of data. Uh, so the first thing we did with that data was to see now who is there, and just a little bit on um, your high school biology. Uh, the different, class, uh, the di the different uh, taxonomic uh, classifications. So we're Homo sapiens, we're the genus species level. Uh, and today I'm just going to show you a little bit of phyla level and a little bit of class level. So this data actually can go a lot deeper than what I'm going to show you today. But this is, for example, the phyla level. So um, for wells 22 and 23, you can see that there's a lot of proteobacteria present. So those are the blue ones. Um, this isn't too surprising. Proteobacteria are uh, known to be quite prevalent in groundwater samples. Uh, you can also see uh, firmicutes and a couple of other well-known ones. Um, what you can also see is there's quite a few of these candidate divisions. And candidate division is actually indicates that it's a novel or new sequence uh, and that there hasn't yet been a member of this uh, phyla that has been properly isolated and sequenced. So this indicates that actually uh, the current databases that are available for this sort of data haven't, there's not enough information in them to be able to classify all of the bacteria that we see. Um, if you were to take wastewater treatment plant or a sediment or something and did similar analysis, you would probably not find these. Uh, so it indicates that we need to do a lot more work in order to understand a uh, groundwater uh, microbial community. So this was on the phyla level. Um, and then, of course, you can go a lot deeper with this. And then what do we want to do? We want to, in the end, be able to compare the microbial community with the geochemistry, so what's in the groundwater, and then also the, micro the emerging contaminant concentrations. Um, and when we try to do that, sorry, when we try to do that, then you get these sorts of graphs. Uh, so this is an overlay of everything possible, so everything that we found in that groundwater. Uh, we try to overlay with, the with them, and you get these sorts of complicated graphs. Um, 
And so I'll try to go through it in a little more uh, simplified way. So this is the microbial community on a class level. So you can see a number of different classes are present. Um, and this graph you can read, um, it's a correlation graph. So it indicates things that correlate with each other. So if from the center origin. So if things are on opposite sides, that means that they are negatively correlated with each other. Arrows that are close together are positively co correlated with each other. And the amplitude, so the distance from the center, from the axes, indicates the strength of the correlation. So if it's a very short arrow, it's not a very strong correlation. If it's a very long arrow, that means that it is. Um, so here you can see the microbial community uh, information. Um, here you can see the wells. So all of the wells are indicated in black dots. Um, and the take home message here is that we see a very stable microbial community. So you can see, for example, here, this well 221, all of the samples cluster together. Uh, similarly, down here for 223, all of the samples cluster together. And that's actually a quite novel finding. Um, there's not that much information, as I said, on groundwater microbial community, and especially very little known on the stability of the community. And for this sort of approach, it's important that we know that our community is quite stable over time. Uh, if you were to sample to assess natural attenuation, and you every year had a different community, then it would be really hard to say what's going on. So this stability is really important. Um, in this graph, you can see the geochemistry of the groundwater, that's in green, uh, and the um, contaminants, those are in red. Uh, and what you can see here, if you just generally look at it, um, is a clearly negative correlation between the presence of a variety of electron acceptors and the presence of these contaminants in DOC. And so what that seems to indicate um, is that if you have sufficient electron acceptors present, then there's sufficient uh, capacity for a degradation of these contaminants, whereas uh, if you have either high concentrations of DOC, so other substrates, or uh, the absence of electron acceptors, then degradation isn't occurring. Um, so this is kind of the, the superficial overview of all of the information. Uh, we're working through this data right now, uh, and then also taking steps to do the next analysis. Um, and there we want to take the step from just looking at the fingerprint to actually looking at the function. Um, so by looking at what genes all of these different bacteria have, you can get insight into their functional capacity, so their capacity for degradation via different routes. Uh, and so that's our next step is to kind of translate that fingerprint into actually uh, an ability. Uh, so my take home message today, I hope that I've convinced you that emerging contaminants are important for groundwater. It's not just nitrate uh, and quantity of groundwater, it's also quality of groundwater. Uh, I think natural attenuation is definitely a viable technology, but we need a lot more research in order to understand it. Uh, and I think a key to this will be using uh, molecular tools. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators and uh, open up for any questions. Thank you. We have time for a quick question. In which you concluded that it was a stable uh, microbial population. And I wonder how you can uh, I'm not familiar with the graphs, but um, how you can conclude that uh, the stability, because I don't see any, let's say, uh, uh, input response uh, in the graph or a time factor in the graph. So, so I, I wonder how, how you conclude, uh, can, can, can say anything about the stability. So we can say about the stability, uh, we have two, in a sense, two time points. We have duplicate samples. Uh, from each time point, so that indicates that if you take two samples at the same time that the pumping in between and stuff doesn't affect the community that much. And then we also have two time points, so one in November 2014 and one in February 2016, so more than a year later, we still see a very similar community. And here I just showed kind of a generic graph, um, but there's also a lot of statistical tools you can use okay, to Okay, so you do have some, some time factor in this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Thank and you. we plan to go again in the, in the winter. So then we'll have three time points. That's and does nice. stability also have something to do with, the, let's say, the complexity of the web of the, the uh, microbes uh, which are uh, existing there? Like the food web and the, the, the more complex food webs are more stable than less complex food webs? Or is that something completely different? Yeah, I think most of the stability is related to the stability of the groundwater composition. So. 
I didn't show it, but if you look at the uh, macro chemistry, so the concentration of DOC and the concentration of nitrate and stuff like that, those are very stable with time, and so that supports a very stable microbial community.